Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? All right, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, before I start with the message, I want to make a small confession so that you kind of get to know who I am a little bit, because um, I think it's good to kind of know the people that are sharing with you. Um, one of the things about me, my nature, my character, is that I hate being told what to do. Is anyone else here that's kind of like that? Like you just hate being told what to do? Um, and it's, 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 it's bad, like to the point where I might be doing something, and then if someone tells me to do it, I will stop doing it, and I no longer want to do that. Like I get in trouble with my wife all the time. Like the trash, for example, is one of those things. I'll be getting ready to do the trash, or in my mind I might be thinking, okay, as soon as this commercial comes on, I'm going to go take out the trash. And then she says, hey, Nate, would you take out the trash? Now I no longer want to take out the trash. Like that's how bad I am with, with being told what to do. Um, it's, it's a problem. I don't know why I am that way, but I am that way. Um, and the reason I tell that is because one of the scriptures that we just recited right now for today is Psalm 139. Now, I want to confess to you, I'm not a big fan of the Psalms. I've never, I mean, I really like David and I like his story, but the Psalms I've just never really been a fan of. Um, they sound kind of whiny to me. Like, here's David, and he's just kind of whining about everything. Um, but I think the real reason I don't like the Psalms is because early on in my faith, uh, I'm a musician, and everyone who's had any kind of authority over me, other pastors and people, they've always said, oh, you're a musician. You will love the Psalms. You should speak about the Psalms. You should do something with the Psalms. You should write a song about the Psalms. And because everyone kept telling me I should do stuff with the Psalms, guess what I never wanted to do? The Psalms. The Psalms. Yes. And I think that's why. So it's one of those books that I just I don't spend much time with it. And um, when, when Pastor Kayla asked me to speak, she sent me what the passages were, and I opened it up. And, you know, we have the option to, like, change it if we want. We didn't have to do that. And I saw it. I'm like, Psalms? I didn't even care what number it was. I just saw Psalms. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that at all. But then I read it, and it started to speak to me. I'm like, okay, let's see what happens. So this is my first time ever talking about the Psalms. I'm really excited about this. <laughs> yeah, I bet you are too now. <laughs> so one of the things about the Psalms is uh, we tend to think of them, specifically 139, which we just read, we tend to think of it as a narrative about God, about the nature of God, about his, his attributes, Here's the thing. That's not true. That's not what this psalm is telling us about. We think it's telling us about who God is and his nature. But I don't believe that that's true. You see, the psalms themselves are actually personal, private prayers. That's what they are. This is one man's prayers uh, to God. When you read through that, and, and you may want to keep it open with you, you can kind of refer to it, you'll notice it's all I and me. You have hemmed me in. You search me. I know this. It's always I and me when you read the Psalms. It's I and me, specifically 139. But we tend to think it's a universal us. He doesn't say we or us. It's always I and me. Now, as a musician, one of my favorite musicians is Miles Davis. And towards the end of his career, the way Miles Davis performed was he often turned his back to the audience. And he would be looking at his musicians, and he would walk over to his musicians, and he would play right next to his musicians, and he would get in their space. And when he wanted to introduce who a musician was, he often would pick up a card that had that musician's name. He didn't even speak to the audience, turned his back, didn't look at him, didn't address them. And he took some criticism for that, but I heard a, an interview as to why he did that, and it's really interesting. His philosophy was, as an artist, he was there to create art. He was creating music. So what happened on the stage was between him and his musicians. That's what he cared about. It was the creative process. So I want to get next to my musicians. I want to feel their energy. We're creating this thing. I am not performing. I am creating something. The audience, they were not the focus. The way he viewed the audience is that they got to be spectators. When they purchased a ticket, their role was they were coming to watch him and his musicians make music. He wasn't performing for them. 
completely different way of looking at what a musical performance could be. The reason I bring that up is because that is the same spirit that I believe the Psalms are created in. These are personal, private prayers between God and David. These are not statements about us in general or, you know, through evermore. This is God and David talking to each other, specifically God, uh, David talking to God. It's not referring to you or me. And when you think of it that way, it changes how you read the Psalms. So here's my first rabbit hole. As a teacher, I was very known for kind of getting sidetracked and going down rabbit holes. So I'm at least going to let you know that's what we're doing right now. Um, Brandy, Brandy mentioned verse 14. And I have always struggled with that verse, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And yeah, it's like one of those really popular, famous uh, verses in the Bible. You see it on t-shirts and all that kind of thing. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But I have always struggled trying to really understand what does that mean? What does it mean that I'm fearfully made? And Brandy spoke about it too, but we'll say things like, well, does that mean I, I have like this, it, does it mean I have this like innate uh, understanding that there is a God above me that is all powerful and has the ability to, you know, bless or curse? Does it mean I have this, do, do, does the word fearful mean like awe and reverence? Does it literally mean fear? And wonderfully, what does that mean? Does, is it referring to like the miracle that happens in the womb in this, this place that's somewhere else that we don't really know, like this miracle happens there? Is that the wonder or all of the uh, all of the things that took for me to actually be here, all the circumstances that happened throughout time that actually led to me specifically being here, what does it mean that I'm wonderfully made or fearfully made? And what it was like for me is I ended up having to do mental gymnastics like I'm doing right now to make that passage really sit with me. It never just felt comfortable. Am I fearfully and wonderfully made? And then it dawned on me David was not talking about me. He was talking about himself. He said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't say Nate was. He didn't say you were. He didn't say we are. But we tend to interpret it that way, that we are all of this, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I'm not here to rain on your parade. Okay? I don't want you to think that maybe you're not fearfully and wonderfully made. Maybe you are. I don't know. But here's the thing. Those adjectives, fearfully and wonderfully, those are David's adjectives, not necessarily ours. They might be yours. But because they're printed in the Bible in that verse doesn't mean that they're yours. Those are David's prayers. Those are David's words. Those are David's understandings. Your adjectives are going to be unique to you and who you understand yourself to be. I know for me, um, well, actually, even before I go there, when I get the opportunity to share my faith with other people, one of the things that I tell them is probably the best part or maybe the most important part or just a very important part about having a relationship with God is he shows you who you are. He constantly reveals to you over time exactly who you are. It's not only about salvation. All those things, yeah, that's obviously, that's, that's important. But in the here and now, your relationship with God, one of the best things that he does is he starts to show you exactly who you are. And that knowledge, really understanding who you are, is the base of being able to navigate through this world to be able to navigate and even prosper, to be able to make it through uh, this thing that we call life. So for me, I might say something like, I am curiously and intentionally made. Those might be my adjectives. I'm a person that always wonders and tries to figure out another way of looking at something, or is there a bigger picture? Like, I'm just a curious kind of person. I don't ever take things just at face value. I always have to manipulate them and, and see. And then, as far as like intentionally, I think about my, my multiracial background, all of the multiple skills and talents, like my music abilities, 
um, and even the things that I've experienced in my life, all of those things have intentionally made me to connect with people, specifically to bridge gaps. Like, that's kind of who I am. That's what I do. I think I was made intentionally to do those kind of things. I was made curiously and intentionally. So, because my background is as a teacher, I always give assignments, even though I'm technically not a teacher in this moment or literally anymore. So I have an assignment for you. I want you to take time and figure out exactly what your adjectives are. Maybe they're fearfully and wonderfully. Maybe there's something else. And I think this is a question we don't ask ourselves very often. How am I made? And if you don't know how you're made, how do you know what to do? How do you know what you could do, what you could become, what your role, what's your purpose, what you're calling, all of those things? How do you know what that is if you don't even know how you're made? So this is not a, uh, uh, a, r- a random assignment that I'm giving you that's like just, you know, for sake of a sermon. I'm actually going to collect this. Yeah, I know. But I will collect it on the other side, right? So I don't know who's going to get there first, but whatever that order happens, I'm going to be waiting at those gates for you, okay? And upon entrance, I'm going to be sitting there, okay, I need that assignment there. I've already made arrangements, okay? So just letting you know, don't slack on this one. I will be collecting it at a certain point. Okay, that's the end of that rabbit hole. So let's kind of get back to that that message. As we look into that passage, um, as I mentioned, we, we understand that this is about the relationship between God and David. That's what we're getting to see. We're getting to see what that relationship looks like. But here's what it really is. This is an illustration of faith. This is what faith is. You could say that that, if you read all of 139, you could say that that is his faith statement. That's what faith looks like to David. Hebrews 11.1 says that faith is the assurance in things hoped for, that it's the conviction of things not seen. We know that faith is the core the basis for how we actually live out our life, for the things that we do, the actions that we take, they come from our faith. So David's faith tells him that God personally searches him. It tells him that God knows everything about him, that he knows where he's going. It tells him that God is protecting him. He's in front of him and behind him. It tells him that God is everywhere and that God is beyond measure. You don't have to look further than those psalms or that specific psalm. You don't have to look further than that to see that that's what he believes. And you can tell that that is why David was successful in everything that he did. Because of that, that faith, that's what allowed him to be the warrior, the leader, the king that he was. As a child of God, that kind of faith, that is our strength. That's the strength in navigating and overcoming this world. That faith actually is our source of life. And this takes us to that second passage, which is another really long passage, Deuteronomy 30. That's the one where Moses is commanding his people, the Israelites, um, to make a choice. Now, I have been a bereaved parent for eight years, and I have learned many, many things in those last eight years, but probably the most profound thing that I've come to understand or way of looking at this life, this world, is that there really are two kingdoms, that life here really is about a choice. There's two ways of looking at reality, of looking at life. And it comes down to there's God's kingdom and there's man's kingdom. And we are constantly asked and challenged to decide which way we're going to operate. Which kingdom are we going to operate out of? We are in both. Well, we're certainly in man's kingdom. It's a choice to operate in God's kingdom. And that is before us constantly, even in the smallest choices and decisions that you make daily. 
it looks like this. Um, when you respond to people or circumstances, the decisions that you make, do you rely on your knowledge, your intellect, your talent, your skill, your ability, your morality? Do you look to the customs, the traditions, the laws that we have created? I'm not saying those things are bad. What I am asking is, where does God fit in that process? Do we rely on our own wisdom as we are navigating how we deal with others and circumstances and situations? Do we rely on what we know, what we've seen, what we've experienced? Or is God in that? More specifically, is he over that? All right, so rabbit hole number two. Don't worry, there's only two, okay? It's the last rabbit hole. Um, I had a really rough week this week. It was, it was kind of a bad week for me. Um, even though I no longer teach at the high school, I'm still very much involved in education and, and doing programs uh, at the high school and with students in general. And the, the state board has kind of passed a new, well, they passed a new bill, so it's law now, that severely affects the way teachers can deal with students. Um, and it's been very, uh, very disappointing and disturbing uh, to me. For me personally, um, this new bill has caused, in order for us to keep in line with it, it's canceled a lot of work that I've spent the last five months doing, writing grants and getting all kinds of people involved. It just like wiped out every, everything that I've been working on for the past five months. I became super, super frustrated with that. I became frustrated because it seems that people that shouldn't be making these decisions are making these decisions. Um, frustrated because these decisions aren't based on really what's good for everybody or considering the bigger picture. Um, frustrated because I felt some people should maybe respond differently or we can't just let these things happen. Remember I told you like, I don't like being told what to do? Very, very frustrating. And in my frustration, I had gotten to the point where I had decided, you know what, why bother with this stuff? Like, that's not my job. I don't even work at the school anymore. Why should I worry about this? And, and, and people that are making these decisions and all these movements that are going on, like, ah, I can't stop that. Like, that's such a big thing. What can I, what can I do with that? So I should just focus on what I can do. I should work with entities that I have a certain amount of control and where I know what I'm gonna do is well received so that the projects that I do are successful, that they, they are seen from the beginning to the end and, and, and all of that. And so I was, I was at the point where I was, you know, I was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna kind of wash my hands of this. And in talking to people, I would have been really justified in doing that because of how I've been burned in some ways. It would make sense to <laughs> not put yourself in that position anymore. Uh, but I was also writing this sermon this week, so, so I wasn't allowed to get away with that because that other voice started to speak inside of my head. And uh, that was the voice that said, you know what, God knows what's going on. He knows what's the, the political strife that we're in and all these things that are going on. He knows that. <coughs> He's here. He knows how I feel about it. He's got me. He's going before me and he's going behind me. And not only that, I could hear that voice say, but Nate, you are perfectly designed for this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't like being told what to do, I am perfectly designed for this. I, uh, yeah, I am no longer a teacher in the school district, so guess what rules don't apply to me? <laughs> now, I'm not saying I'm about breaking rules, but I'm just saying, I, I mentioned like curiosity and intentionality. I am of the mind that I will find the bigger picture, a bigger way to work around things. 
I've been intentionally put in places where I no longer have to submit to this. I can do that. God was showing me that he is there and that I am made for these kind of things. For me, that became, that was like me being in that statement of faith. That was like Psalm 139 for me, realizing how God is there in this situation and with me and what I can do. And it flipped and it changed the way that I saw the circumstance completely. So I don't tell you this because I want you to be aware of politics or the inner workings of my mind. I share this with you as an example of this is how life works. We are constantly put in positions where we have to make a choice. Nate, do you choose man's way that says it's justified to walk away from this problem because it's not yours to begin with? And if these people don't want you to help and do this kind of stuff, then don't help them. Find where you're going to be successful. Find where, you know, it's going to be a good thing for you. Don't deal with all that uncomfort. You don't have to make that sacrifice. Man's laws will tell me to do that. Or there's the kingdom choice that says, you know what? You were made for this. I'm here. I know what's going on. Do what you were made to do. We are faced with these kind of decisions all the time, every day, from big ones like that to smaller ones like, should I take the trash out after my wife asked me to take the trash out, <laughs> right? Okay, that's the end of rabbit hole number two. So now we're bringing this thing home. Those two passages, I think they connect in the most amazing way. Uh, in, in Deuteronomy 30, Moses is commanding, which is another thing which got to me that he's commanding them to make a choice i command you to do this thing just uh, sorry rabbit hole number three really quick um when you hear that language in the bible about commands and things like that because moses is saying i command you to make this choice it's not how we think of the word command that's we, we call that like kingdom language and what command what that word really means is that this request is coming from a place of authority Okay, it doesn't mean that you have to do that. We tend to think a command is something you have to do. No, command means that this request is coming from a place of authority. And not just authority, but authority that is attached to a consequence. So if you read the rest of Deuteronomy 30, he's saying, I command you to make this choice. And then he says, this is about life and prosperity versus death and destruction. Because God has the power to make that. It's like if I'm driving down the highway, my wife can and does say, hey, you're going too fast. You know, please go under the speed limit. Stop speeding. When she says that, it's a request. She's asking. <laughs> Depending on how you interpret that. <laughs> However, when the policeman says, hey, stop speeding, that's different because he has the authority to give me a ticket, to find me, or whatever. He is speaking with authority. My wife is making a request. Those are two different things. So understand that when you read this type of thing in the Bible, uh, that there's kingdom language, and, and, and command really is a request that is followed with or supported by or backed by authority, which uh, usually comes with a consequence. Okay, so end of rabbit hole number three. What ties these two passages together is they are both about faith. See, with David and his prayers, he's telling you what he thinks about God and how he relates to God. He's showing you what his faith looks like, that source of his actions. Deuteronomy, we're being called to use our faith to make a decision. Whatever faith it is that we have in here, use that to make this decision for which kingdom you are going to follow, God's way or man's way. It's about faith. This is the beginning of Israel, and, 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 and Moses is saying, which kind of nation are we going to be? You need to make a choice. And that choice is coming from a place of authority. Okay, last point I'm going to make. There's a lot in both of those scriptures, and there's a lot that I didn't talk about. There's some interesting, controversial points and interesting things to talk about. They all deserved a, a, a different sermon. I wanted this to, to revolve around faith because that's the first thing that it spoke to me. I didn't mention really the juxtaposition of life and success versus death and disaster 
because it literally says if you choose this way, you're going to have life and success and, you know, like everything's going to be great. But if you choose this way, you're going to have death and disaster. But we know it doesn't always work out that way. But that depends on what kingdom you're looking at and how you define life and death, how you define success and disaster. I want to take you back to, to David, just his story. From the time he was a young man, you know, the, the, you know coming up against Goliath and, and dealing with King Saul, becoming the great king, all the wonderful things that he did. You hear these accounts of his prayer life. That's what Psalms is. His relationship with God fuels all of that stuff. But we know there's also a dark time where David steps away from that and he covets Bathsheba and he has her husband Uriah killed. The thing that you'll notice in this part of the Bible, this is 2 Samuel, you don't hear any accounts of that relationship with God happening. You don't hear that faith. I don't know if it's there or not. It's not accounted for in the scripture. But what it leads me to believe is that something went wrong with that relationship. And David started acting on his own will for his own desires, for his own purposes. Death and disaster did follow. But worse than that is that relationship was severed. That relationship, that is life. Our faith, which creates that relationship, is life. So the question that I leave us with is where is that faith? For David, it was on his mind when he woke up and when he went to bed. I know that I have a lot of work to do. Where are you? Where are we all? I will leave you with that question.